My name is Ellie Johnston. I'm the Climate and Energy Lean at Climate Interactive. I'm here with Caroline Reed. Caroline, do you want to walk us through uh, the interface and um, just some notes on the GoToMeeting? Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you today. Um, my name's Ellie Johnston. As I said before, I know a few more people have just jumped on. Uh, we've got a few over 100 people um, here. It's the morning here on the East Coast, but I know many of you all are joining in the evening hours, midday hours all over the world. Um, it's exciting to have you all here. Um, as Caroline mentioned, we're using the GoToWebinar interface. Caroline, anything else you would add about um, technical things? Uh, no, just that you will all be able to use that questions box, as you can see on Ellie's slide, to write in. So. If you think of questions along the way, feel free to drop them in there. We'll answer some of them at the end of the workshop live on audio. Others, I'll just try my best to write back to you during the session. Um, or if you have any comments, there are other uh, moments where we'll want you to write in. So identifying that box is helpful. Great. Thanks, Thanks Caroline. Um, and also, if you have any questions that are of greater length or you want sort of a more formal email reply, you can uh, reach out to us at climateinteractive.org slash support. There's a way to kind of file support tickets there. So do utilize that. Um, so what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be discussing climate change solutions. And we're gonna be using uh, this free interactive tool that we at Climate Interactive have developed with the MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative. Uh, with this tool, what we're gonna do here in this hour long-ish webinar is co-create a global path of action to achieve the Paris Agreement goals. And uh, a critical component of this will be to, to also prompt and discuss some of the ways in which this could be done equitably. Uh, so to get started, the inroad simulator that we're gonna be using is this cutting edge simulation model that's used to test climate solutions and generate climate scenarios for the future. It's created using the best available science uh, data from the IEA, the World Bank, uh, and many other sources is synthesized and aggregated together to create this tool that gives us a global picture of what types of actions on climate change have uh, high leverage or low leverage. Uh, we'll be digging into it in just a second. Um, as I mentioned, this was developed by a team of us here at Climate Interactive. Caroline and I um, are on the team at Climate Interactive and also the MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative, as well as a number of other partners. Um, I see uh, partners even here on the webinar today who have helped us with critical components like translation of the tool into many different languages um, and just have brought different ideas and, and experimented with the ways in which a tool like En-ROADS can be used in a lot of different settings. Uh, since we released En-ROADS a little over a year ago, we have seen events worldwide. It's been incredible. Uh, over 39,000 people have participated in En-ROADS events in 67 countries. And these events have been led by over 600 facilitators. Um, so if you're wondering, wh where are these facilitators coming from? Many people, and this could be you, um, have gone through our ambassador training program and become what are known as inroads climate ambassadors. These are people who are facilitators, they're leading the events and sharing it with others out there in the world. Um, so you can go to climateinteractive.org slash ambassadors if that's of interest to, to you. It's not the focus of, of the webinar today. Today, I just wanna uh, let you all see and, and we're gonna explore uh, inroads together. So to get started and uh, is, you know, we have this big agreement, big global agreement, the Paris Climate Agreement. It aims to limit warming to well below two degrees and aim for 1.5. Uh, many of you all I saw in the chat, uh, some of you all mentioning this here in the United States, uh, those of us that work on climate change are very excited because yesterday uh, our new president, President Biden, um, re got the US back into the Paris Agreement. So this, the United States is of course one of the major emitters in the world and our absence from this global agreement was not good, <laughs> not good at all. And uh, so our re-entry to that, hopefully hopefully here today, we are sitting on the cusp of a, of a new era of climate engagement from the United States and hopefully we can be strong partners to all the other countries out there in terms of helping to support 
climate action in all different all different ways. But what is that actually going to take to to reach this big lofty goal? What does that even mean? The limit warming to well below two degrees? That's what we're going to be diving into today. And I want to come at this by first um, thinking about where we sit today. So, and I'll turn off my camera too, so it's a little less distracting. You can see the screen bigger. Um, so where we sit right now is here we are, 2021. We're seeing about a one degree of warming already. If we continue on the course that we're on with kind of limited climate action, uh, we expect to see over three degrees of temperature rise by the end of the century. So upwards of 3.6 degrees Celsius, that for uh, those in the United States is equivalent to 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which of course is not, not a scenario at all that we can let our world get to. The impacts um, already at one degrees have been quite devastating. We saw that uh, 2020 was tied with um, 2016, I believe, as the hottest year on record. Um, many, many areas around the world saw devastating heat waves last year, drought conditions, fires, um, and, and then also paired with very extreme weather events. So uh, devastating hurricane season that was that in the Southeast of the United States and the Caribbean uh, that really, really um, caused a lot of havoc. That's at one degree. Um, as we see the temperature change and go up, up further and further, those impacts really build on themselves. And we, we see mass um, extinction of animals and just uh, levels of extreme heat that will make it very, very difficult uh, for, for many communities to, to thrive um, during summer conditions. So we want to avoid all of this. What does it take? And I want to start and come at this question of building out this kind of whole suite of actions on climate by first reflecting on what actions have you heard of that have been enacted recently that you think will have positive climate impact implications. Of course, right now the pandemic is still devastating our economies, our communities, um, causing loss of life around the world. We have vaccines, they're unrolling. And so there's this light perhaps at the end of the tunnel of the pandemic. How will we recover? How will we build back better? Um, what are some of the things that you all are seeing uh, in all the different corners of the world that, that, that you all are coming from that have been enacted? So not things that are just being talked about, but things that are being passed or the action that you're seeing. Maybe it's even action that you're taking yourself that have had, that you think have positive climate impact implications. And we'll use that as the starting point from which to build uh, our, our scenario today. And what I'm gonna do, Caroline's gonna read out some of the things that you all have written in, and then I'm gonna test them in the uh, En-ROADS uh, simulator and show you all that. So Caroline, do you wanna read out uh, some of the things that you're seeing people chime in with? Yeah, and they're, they're just starting to come in. Um, but a couple of things I'm seeing are things like plans for electrification of public transportation, rescinding the Keystone pipeline permit, uh, decreasing the price for renewable energy, um, and expanding technology such as batteries for solar and other types of renewables, uh, phasing out coal-powered electricity in Canada. Um, overall, just a lot of people writing in about lower costs for renewables. Uh, people biking a lot more. Let's see. A lot of people just re-emphasizing to quit coal, quit gas, um, raising a carbon price, more electrification of the energy supply. Great. Uh, that's That gives us an excellent starting point, and I may come back to that list um, and get some more examples, but I've jotted down a few of them. Um, and uh one of the one of the first things i heard about um was a decreased cost of renewable energy it sounded like several of you all uh, are thinking about that falling cost of renewable energies in, in some cases this is just from technological innovation and in other cases it's uh from direct uh investment and subsidies from 
uh, governmental institutions or big public-private partnerships or intergovernmental uh, institutions investing in it. Um, so let's see and just take a look at the uh, as that as our starting point. But before I jump into moving sliders around, uh, let me just orient you all to what you're looking at. So this is En-ROADS. Um, on the left is a graph of global sources of primary energy from the year 2000 all the way out to 2100. You see here we have coal on the bottom, oil, natural gas here in blue, renewables in green, bioenergy there in pink, then nuclear. On the right, uh, we're showing greenhouse gas net emissions. Again, it's also going from the year 2000 out to 2100. If we have this mix of, of energy here, of which includes some fossil fuels that uh, release carbon dioxide emissions, and we have other sources of emissions that come from forestry, methane, and nitrous oxide, and other things, it leads to a steady rise in global greenhouse gas emissions, which then uh, puts us on that trajectory towards uh, 3.6 degrees by the end of the century that we were looking at earlier. But what we have down here is this whole control panel of different uh, possible sliders that we can adjust and move to test out different, different pathways. So, for example, for renewables, what if we made renewables much cheaper? So by subsidizing them, and you can see as I do that, you can see the, the, the simulator runs and responds and charts out a different kind of scenario. So with renewables being highly subsidized, that green wedge is much larger than it was before. And you can see greenhouse gas net emissions come down some, as well as that temperature came down ever so slightly. Um, so that's one possible action and, um, and in terms of addressing climate change. As we think about cheaper renewable energy, I'm curious, um, what are some of the other benefits beyond climate change, beyond reducing our carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions, what are some of the other benefits that come from installing solar panels and building wind turbines and utilizing all the different kinds of renewable energy methods we have out there? Um, does anyone have any ideas about that, Caroline? Are you seeing anything? Yeah, I'm seeing people are just starting to write in. Um, good job. Uh, less air pollution, mm -hmm. increased health equity compared to like dirtier sources of energy. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things just commenting on how it would increase uh, air quality. Yeah, increased air quality. That's a that's of course a big one. And and um, as we get to some of these other types of interventions that you all have mentioned too, um, we can look at that. And and within En-ROADS, there are many, many different types of graphs that you can look at. So we don't have to just focus here on greenhouse gas net emissions. Oh, really quickly, we'll take a look at air pollution from energy. And you can see, so this is PM 2.5 emissions, global, uh, PM 2.5 is size, particulate matter, the 2.5 microns in size. It's, um, it's particularly devastating to uh, health impacts related to respiratory um, issues, causes all kinds of complications there. Um, and a major source of PM 2.5 emissions worldwide is from coal-fired power plants. So as we, um, let me just replay the action. So as we subsidize renewable energy, we have more renewable energy, it makes those that air quality come down. So it's a little more improved uh, as to what it was otherwise. So that is good news. Also, um, the mention of jobs, that's also an important one in terms of job creation. Um, renewable energy does is creating lots and lots of jobs worldwide. I think there's something like 11 million people already employed in um, the clean energy jobs economy. But let's go back to the regular graphs. The next thing, and actually the first thing that you mentioned, Caroline, was a uh, a really important intervention that we're seeing discussed in a lot of places, which is the electrification of our public transit system. So um, city buses, uh, and really China has been the leader in terms of the scale at which they're employing electric buses uh, throughout the country. Uh, many other countries are also adopting electric buses. Here where I live in Asheville, North Carolina, I have noticed that our City buses are starting to, they've started to buy some electric buses. Um, and when we talk, when we're moving this slider, 
uh, and thinking about this within the context of En-ROADS, we're thinking about electrification of the entire transport system. So what if we have more electric buses, but also more electric cars for um, passenger vehicles, electric trucks, uh, using electric trains where um, those can be implemented, and also figuring out ways to electrify other parts of our transport um, system that, that we haven't figured out yet. So what if we Im increase the rate of electrification? So as I do this, before I do this, I'm curious if we have a massive scale of electrification where we have electric buses, electric cars, all of this stuff worldwide, think to yourself, what do you think uh, would happen to greenhouse gas emissions and the global temperature with lots of electrification, given the energy mix that we have here. Think to yourself, do you think um, it's gonna make greenhouse gas emissions fall a lot, maybe just a little? Uh, and and as, I, as I move this, uh, think about, is that a surprising outcome that you see or what? So I'm gonna move this. We're gonna, we're gonna just scale up electrification a lot. Um, so you see here, let me replay the last change. And let's see, let's start with this left graph. What do we notice here about the left graph that happens? I'm going to replay the change and let's look at this left graph. What's going on here is we're increasing transport electrification. Well, it looks like a green, green area for renewables is getting a little wider. Also, this uh, wedge here for oil, uh, a little more narrow than it was before. All of those cars um, and buses and everything are burning much less oil than they were. Um, so that's a big improvement there. Um, it's coming down, greenhouse gas emissions are coming down some and it's making some difference. It's not, the, the gains are, are not um, really huge. Um, and part of the reason why uh, what's going on here is that as we're electrifying all of these different transport sectors, yes, they're not using so much oil, but um, they're using some of the other fossil fuels that are in our electrical grid still. So this coal, this natural gas here, in addition to the renewables, they're all sources of electric, they're all generating electricity. So whatever becomes electrified is just using the available electricity on the grid. However, as we uh, reduce our fossil fuels, uh, particularly our fossil fuels that are generating electricity, uh, we'll, we'll we'll be able we'll get be getting more gains because of um, the electrification that we've already done in advance. So it's an important step um, in terms of being able to decarbonize our our energy system. You can't you, we have to figure out a way to to not burn so much oil, um, but we also have to make sure that the electricity that is uh, powering all those batteries and everything is uh, is clean as clean as possible. Um, okay and. Uh, related to that, uh, someone mentioned phasing out coal plants, um, and I think that was really some, somebody was referring to it in Canada. So phasing out um, coal. So when we ha we have these sliders here, so we can tax coal um, or subsidize it, um, but we can also go under um, into the advanced views of En-ROADS. So I'm going to click on the three dots here, and I'm going to scroll down and we have a, a variety of different ways that we can just um, get rid of coal. So we can reduce the amount of utilization of coal or we can uh, stop building no coal infrastructure at all. Um, we can also accelerate the retirement of coal power plants. I'm going to reduce, I'm going to, in this kind of idea of phasing out, um, I'm going to do a reduction in coal utilization. So starting this year, we'll say we, um, really phase out coal use. And I think a, a, and a, a big piece of this too is that you know we're not gonna build any more coal infrastructure. So as we do this, you see we're really shutting down coal and it made a significant impact in terms of the temperature. So here is where we were to begin with at 3.4 degrees. And with uh, stopping coal utilization, we brought it down to 3.1 and then that making sure that we're not building any more coal plants um, brought us to three degrees. So we really kicked coal out in this scenario. And going back to that discussion of what are some of the 
co-benefits, um, the other reasons why we might phase out coal. I mentioned how coal is a big contributor to air pollution. And of course, um, coal-fired coal power plants are oftentimes cited in um, more low-income communities uh, in the United States and many other countries. They're cited in communities of color where people have been historically marginalized. Um, and, we're, and, and as a result, we see increased rates of asthma and other respiratory um, illnesses. When we shut down those coal-fired power plants, it creates direct health benefits for those communities. And you can see that our, remember when we just um, had subsidized renewable energy, we saw that the air quality came down some, but it was still rising because we still had coal in the mix. Now that we've shut down coal, um, pretty much completely, you see uh, air quality gets significantly better and we just don't have the, the PM 2.5 emissions from our energy sector that we had before. So big health benefits there um, that cannot be underestimated. And in, in some ways, uh, when uh, people do analysis of like kind of the, the economics of uh, the air pollution benefits, the climate benefits, these health benefits re really um, are, are make a lot of sense uh, for and, and have very near term benefits uh, for communities. So uh, let me go back to the our home graphs. And you notice here um, we have with these few actions with our cheap renewable energy, our phasing out of coal um, and our electric cars and buses and everything, we have flattened emissions. So emissions are no longer growing. Um, but one thing to note here is that, so while our greenhouse gas emissions are flat, if I go and look at our temperature change, our temperature is still going up. Now think about that. Is that an expected dynamic? Um, why is temperature going up if our greenhouse gas emissions are flat? You would think, you know, maybe there might be something else um, here. But one, one, one thing that we use, and let me actually, uh, let me pop out of here and go to one of my slides. Um, there is an analogy that we use uh, of, a, of a bathtub when thinking about these kinds of dynamics. And so let's see here. Um, so the, even as the emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions are flat, they're not changing. They're just steady, steady at whatever level we had left them at. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and but meanwhile, the temperature, which is a result of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, so the um, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere and the other greenhouse gases. Meanwhile, that continues to go up. So what's going on there? It just means that we are releasing emissions, if you think about this like a bathtub. So you have the tap, the faucet, where the water comes in. Now, we were steadily churning the knob so that the emissions were growing and growing and growing and growing. And what we have done so far in the, the few moves that we've made is we just stopped churning the knob. There's still a lot of, uh, uh, of water, or in this case, um, greenhouse gas emissions coming out of that tap and into the tub, it's coming out at a steady rate. But that steady rate is higher than the amount that is being removed. So like a bathtub, if you have your drain open, uh, but maybe it's clogged up, um, then the, the amount in the tub will not go down as fast. And so what we need to do, just like if we were to want it to stabilize, want to stabilize the level of water in, the, in a bathtub, is we would want the drain to be removing just as much as, uh, as was coming in or turn, turn both nozzles off entirely. Plug the drain up and uh, turn off the tap so that way uh, there is no more coming in. This, um, this is kind of one simple way to just think about the challenge of climate change is that we have to figure out how to create a balance between our emissions coming in and our removals going out. Um, I'll show this to you one other way real quickly. Um, so we have CO2 emissions and removal. So here's our 
CO2 emissions, relatively flat, now that we're not having burning so much coal, we have increased renewables, but we still have some uh, sources of CO2 emissions out there. Here, uh, this blue line below it is our CO2 removals. So currently, we're releasing in uh, the amount going into the quote-unquote tub of uh, the climate is about twice as high as what's going out. Therefore, we see increased temperature change. It, well, we see increased um, concentration of, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which leads to increased temperature change. What we need to do is make this red line here of emissions meet this blue line of CO2 removals. Um, and there's a couple different strategies that we, we might take to, to do that. And we can check back later on uh, to see how we're doing on that regard. But that's really what's going to enable us to get that, um, that temperature change graph to go from, so I'm looking at, we're looking at temperature change now, um, and it's still steadily rising, but to get it within that range of below two degrees and aiming for 1.5 as the Paris Agreement outlines. Um, Caroline, you also mentioned that someone had raised um, that they are seeing more people biking and things, and that can have a climate benefit. So one, we have talked about the electrification of transport, but there's also energy efficiency, the movement of goods and services and people from different points um, around communities around the world um, can be done more efficiently. If you are biking to work, say, or biking to get um, food uh, for your family, um, that means that you are not burning all of that energy that it takes to fire up the car or uh, get on the bus and drive it around. Um, so that's a that's a kind of a form of energy conservation that's included in this um, slider of energy efficiency. There's also just things like buying, um, you know, if people are making decisions about buying vehicles, choosing cars that are more fuel efficient. Um, in some many countries, there are now standards at which, you know, um, cars must be more and more energy efficient every year. Um, and, and we also see many, many policies around in electrification. So I'm gonna improve transport energy efficiency. And as we do that, notice what's happening here on the left. Um, so in particular, I'm gonna, I'll leave it here and then we'll replay that change. So as we improve the energy efficiency of our transport sector, you see that the total line here at the top, that's going down as well as um, replay last change here. You can see everything else is kind of getting squished down. But if we have increased energy efficiency, we can do more and still have the same economic productivity around the world. So our total energy demand um, comes down as a result of things like riding bikes and also just improving the efficiency of car fleets and trucks and shipping and all different kinds of things. Um, can can really help things there. Um, okay, so I've run through some of the things that you all raised, and I'm curious. Um, maybe maybe some of you out there were mentioning, were thinking of things that you're hearing about being enacted, but you haven't seen yet. Things that 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 are that sound promising in terms of addressing climate change. Maybe they're things that you're personally working on advocating for. Um, in your community or uh, at different uh, levels of government. What are some things that we also need? We've, we've really done a lot here on our transportation system. Our, uh, we've made renewables are much cheaper and we've really phased out coal. But what else is it gonna take to get to those um, goals within the Paris Agreement of limiting warming well below two degrees and aiming for 1.5? What else is it gonna take? Um, Caroline, have you seen some other ideas come in uh, that, that we should test here? Yeah, so and people are writing more to as we speak, but um, I'm seeing people commenting on changing their diet, so maybe switching to like a vegan or a vegetarian diet, um, looking at how we can either limit deforestation or increase our afforestation. Um, a lot of people writing in just about methane being a, a huge issue. Um, 
new technologies. So like it could be innovations in carbon removal, uh, nuclear fission. Great. Well, that's a great place to start. So the, at first we were focused on different um, sources of energy. And that was kind of where, where we were um, working on the problem of climate change, which is of course a big, big area. Um, there's something like, um, I believe it's nearly, it's over 70% of emissions are coming from our energy sector. But then there's this whole other portion of the wedge, a little over a quarter of emissions coming from other sources. So this, uh, as many of you all identified, methane emissions is, a, is a one of those sources. I'll switch the graph here. Let's look at um, this graph here, which is showing greenhouse gas net emissions by gas. So in dark gray here, this is our energy carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, at the bottom is the CO2 emissions, uh, the carbon dioxide emissions from land use and land use change. That's the deforestation that some of you all brought up. Um, then above that, uh, in this thin yellow gold line here is the F gases. F gases are um, things like our hydrofluorocarbons. They are utilized in things like refrigeration and different types of technology, the uh, production of semiconductors and things like that. Um, then we have in blue our methane emissions. That's a significant wedge that is going that we haven't touched at all uh, so far. And then on top is our nitrous oxide emissions in purple. That is, um, those come from our industrial agricultural systems. So people mentioned methane and also in particular changing diets. So we'll just start with this question of uh, diets and also, you know, our, our whole food system. So as I go under the three dots here for methane and other gas, I'm going to use use detailed settings. And you see we have a slider here for agricultural and waste emissions. So this is just reducing the methane and nitrous oxide emissions that are tied up in, in our food system and also our, our waste and sewage system as uh, we put food waste and other, all of the other kinds of waste we have into our landfills. Uh, it releases uh, methane as it decomposes and and that kind of thing. So as I do this, did you all notice the change it made? So here we were uh, before, and watch what happens to that blue wedge there on the right side. I'll replay that in case you didn't see it. So here's our blue wedge representing methane, also the purple of nitrous oxide. Uh, so as we implement it changes across our agricultural and waste emissions, we really make redu significant reductions there those come down uh, quite far. And it's important to note that there is kind of a floor to how much reductions we can make here. We have to feed the world and it's important that we do that well. Um, and we're not going to be able to get a methane free food system um, by doing things like um, uh, reducing meat consumption, particularly methane, um, a big source of methane emission comes from cows. Uh, there's also experiments being done on different things that we could potentially feed cows to reduce their amount of the, the amount of methane that they release. I have heard about scientists who have found really promising results around feeding cows seaweed. Um, this is a surprise to me. It's it's uh, not our area of research, but could be a possible solution to making. Um, things like beef and dairy more um, more ca carbon, more beneficial to the climate. Um, also another source of methane emissions are, are uh, come from bogs and, and rice paddy production. So this is another area where pe farmers and uh, agricultural scientists are trying to figure out ways in which to produce our food uh, for the world in ways that is uh, less intensive in terms of greenhouse gases. Um, one other key component as we talk about changing diets and we think about um, uh, our agricultural system is also to remember that a lot of um, a lot of land use change is tied up in a need for more land for food, uh, for food production and for for uh, 
cattle to graze and to grow more things like soybeans and things. So when we think about dietary change, I also think about, you know, moving down deforestation a little bit here. It's not going to, it's not the solution to stopping all deforestation, but it definitely helps some deforestation too uh, if, when we can come up with ways of reducing that meat demand uh, that we have in our food system. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, somebody brought up just methane emissions more generally. So the other sources of methane, uh, natural gas leakage is one of them. Um, and just throughout our energy and industrial emissions, we have methane emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, and there's F gases. I mentioned the F gases as it relates to refrigeration and things like that, air conditioning units. There are some really promise, there's a, some good progress in the global policy space around things like F gases. Um, related to the Montreal Protocol, uh, several years ago, the countries of the world came together and they added an amendment to it called the Kigali Amendment, in which uh, they said they, they set out an intention to phase out F gases. Um, so this is an area where uh, there are there's some good progress to really eliminate those F gases and we can reduce those too. And you see, as I as I do this, um, these this reduction from our methane and other gases sector has a significant impact. We started at 2.9 before I moved that agricultural and waste emissions slider, and now we're down to 2.4, well on our way to reaching that goal of limiting warming to well below two. But is it enough on its own? No. Um, so as we say around here at Climate Interactive, it takes many seeds to plant a garden. Uh, we're going to have to do a whole suite of different actions. So yes, it's going to take those of you working on uh, stopping pipelines and phasing out coal-fired power plants. It's going to take people switching over to electric buses and cities and uh, biking places. It's going to take a whole different variety of different actions here. Um, so I want to go on to the the other area that uh, several of you have keyed in on that's outside of our energy sector too in some ways is these these land and forestry interventions so that we have deforestation here and then there's also afforestation so deforestation is the cutting down the removal of trees and forest uh and and oftentimes as a result this is a result of a need for land to do other things, um, namely agriculture. Um, and then down here, we have afforestation. So afforestation is tree planting, planting trees at a large scale such that they will remove carbon from the atmosphere. You see here up on this graph of greenhouse gas net emissions by gas, this thin green line here at the bottom it started kind of, you know, it was a little wider here. We we did some minor reductions in deforestation, so it's very thin. If we further reduce uh, deforestation, we can bring it down uh, such that net deforestation is stopped worldwide by around the year 2050. Uh, it brings down the temperature another tenth of a degree. But then um, someone mentioned afforestation. So this is planting trees. So um, we can then scale up the amount of tree planting happening. And that you see brings down things a further tenth of a degree. The one thing to note here is you see this uh, here on the y-axis, it says zero. So now this green line here is coming down below zero because our whole land use sector is now becoming a net a uh, source of removals of CO2 emissions. Um, so now we are getting, uh, we're removing more than we are releasing um, in that land use sector. So that's important as we think back to that idea of uh, a climate bathtub or a bathtub in which we have those uh, removals and uh, and emissions. So you can see here before when we looked at this graph of CO2 emissions and CO2 removals, we were, uh, we our CO2 emissions and greenhouse gases were kind of flat along the top. And now CO2 emissions, they're getting closer. So we're getting closer to being able to stabilize 
um, that temperature change, that concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but still not quite yet there. Um, so we need to find a couple more different areas. Before going there, um, and while we're talking about deforestation and afforestation, I'm curious, um, some of you all may have ideas about this. Does Can anyone come up with or think about um, some of the equity considerations that we need to keep in mind when reducing deforestation and in particular when planting trees? What are some of the ways in which these kinds of policies could be implemented that would hurt uh, vulnerable committee, commu communities that, that might not have the benefits that we would want? Some things that we need to watch out for as we think about advocating for and working on solutions around the forestry sector. I'm curious if anyone, um, some of you all may be experts in this field and are joining the webinar. Um, others of you all may just ha have, have experience or have, have heard of things uh, that we should be aware of and think about in terms of uh, avoiding harms to uh, communities when it comes to planting trees and stopping deforestation. Um, Caroline, have there been any ideas that have come up? What What are some of the ways in which we we um, we want to avoid hurting communities with a plant tree planting policies and, and deforestation? Yeah, it's a, a great question. Um, and a couple of people have written in things to look out for. Um, so a lot of communities depend on lumber, and so that also could be people who are using that for their fuel source. Um, you have to think about how this might impact job loss and displacement. Um, you might want to think about how uh, industries like deforestation are tied to economies of other nations. Um, things with afforestation might be related to also planting trees that could be invasive and that could hurt um, the agricultural uh, out or produce for, for certain people that they depend on. Um, more people looking at environmental migration um, and losses, losses of biodiversity. Great, yeah, Th thank you for those of you um, that shared some of those ideas. That's, those are wonderful, and, and with any of these different sliders we move, we, we, we need to realize that the local implementation of these policies, we're, we're talking about this today and on this call with people from all over the world, um, and we're making this big global scenario but we can't forget about the ways in which these actions are implemented on the ground and for different communities that's gonna look differently. And But there are critical things that we need to keep in mind. If we're talking about large scale afforestation, for example, um, where is that land coming from? Who owns that land currently? Um, and also what is being planted? Are we just planting trees um, for carbon benefit or also, or is there a way that we can um, be planting trees and supporting ecosystem restoration in a way that improves biodiversity outcomes? Um, just to give you a sense of the scale. And so what we do at Climate Interactive is we're trying to synthesize all of these different studies that researchers are coming up with around the potential scale of action in all of these different domains. When it comes to afforestation, the thing that really um, uh, we find fascinating and I think is an important consideration as we think about some of these types of solutions is how much it really um, requires, how much land it really requires to, to, to do some of this stuff. So here's our afforestation slider. I just had moved it there to high growth, for example. And you can see, um, so this graph is showing land for carbon dioxide removal. The only approach we've taken so far is, to, is around afforestation. This dotted line here is showing us the area of India. So if you think of a global map, India is a massive nation. Um, and in this current scenario, by the year 2060, we would have planted enough trees globally to uh, equal the size of India and beyond. Um, so when we're talking about these, this kind of action, it's really at a very large scale in which we see um, temperature outcomes of significant levels. That's not to say that tree planting isn't um, important either. Um, it has lots of important Im impacts for um, creating tree canopy, for biodiversity, for 
improving things. Um, but just in terms of when we think about scale, when we think about leverage, we have to keep our eyes on the things that are, are, are really the drivers of emissions, uh, which is stopping the, 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 the energy sector and also just stopping the different sources of emissions. As um, our colleague at um, MIT, John Sturman, oftentimes reminds us, it's easier for a business to prevent a problem than it is to clean it up. We want to prevent climate change. We don't want to have to clean up our emissions by trying to figure out all the different ways to remove it, uh, once remove the carbon once it's in the atmosphere. Uh, and companies know this well when you know you think about the scandals and things like that that have arisen. It's so much easier if you can do your safety checks and get everything right, follow the regulations first, um, than if you have to clean up messes later. Um, but uh, so thanks there for, for some of those considerations around, around the equity points of land use change. And remember that, that the different kinds of equity considerations show up in all of the different sliders. Um, and, and if you are ever curious and you're like, what, what are some of the equity considerations for you know, energy efficiency transport? What you can do is click on the three dots, go under the I, the help button here, and scroll through and we have things like the potential co-benefits of encouraging energy efficiency, the equity considerations. You can also read some about where the um, slider values come from and different dynamics, as well as read examples of uh, places where um, different policies have, uh, different example policies have been implemented. So check out this. I, this is also reflected in the um, user guide. So I can click this button here at the bottom. It'll take me over to um, the Inroads User Guide, which has a number of different. It just has pages on every slider, all the major sliders. That is um, that you can read more about if you're curious. And um, maybe Caroline, you could drop the link in, or maybe I can do that for uh, the user guide. Here, I'll put. Yeah, it I got that. Okay, thanks, Caroline. And. And then someone else, and uh, let's see, we're at 2.2 degrees. So we are well on our way. You can see our greenhouse gas net emissions are falling. And, um, and we have lots of renewable energy here. Overall, our, we still see some emissions coming from this in, the, our energy sector in general. We still have some natural gas and oil in the picture. Um, I heard someone mention new technology, um, and we have this slider over here that we haven't touched yet. So there's all different types of new technology that would necessarily need to be developed and implemented to do all to move to for all of these different kinds of sliders. You know, think about the amount of new technology and innovation needed for uh, for our to electrify things. We need all the batteries and everything. That what we have here, however, is something like, you know, what about thorium-based nuclear fission or nuclear fusion? These are types of energy sources that have been, you know, in some cases that have been discussed for a long time, but they're still very much in the research and development phase. There are labs working around the world to try and pioneer and develop um, these new approaches to generating, to generating energy. And what we have here within En-ROADS is kind of, we can test this. That's the power of a simulation model. We can't, um, we, we're, we get to move things for the world and test them out, try them out. Um, just in the same way that an airplane pilot, you know, uses flight simulators to practice flying before they're actually sitting in the cockpit of a real airplane uh, where the stakes are much higher. So we can say, okay, well, what if, we have some kind of new zero carbon energy source, something that we don't have commercially available just yet. Um, and you know, we see this also a pop up in fiction all the time and stories and movies, things like the flux capacitor and stuff like that, that could potentially revolutionize um, the sources of energy for our world. What if we had something like that? So this is kind of, a, I think this slide is kind of fun um, to imagine the possibilities here. But let's see, what, what if we had a huge breakthrough in this new um, zero carbon technology? It would be as cheap as coal, it would be clean, it wouldn't have health impacts, 
um, it would be everything we, we dream. Do you think that that will be enough to get us below two degrees? Um, think to yourself, and let me just move the slider here. We have a breakthrough. We have a huge breakthrough. All right, so you see here on the, on the left graph here in orange, we now have this new zero technology that's now appearing as part of our energy mix. I'm gonna replay the change and let's see what's going on here. Oh, we will get it there in a second. Okay, so if we replay it, so there, that's where we were before, that's where we are now. What do you notice? What I'm seeing is that it's really coming in and we had this green wedge representing renewables was much bigger than it was now that we have the new zero carbon technology. So in effect, the this new zero type of carbon energy comes in and it's competing with all of the other sources of energy out there in the market. So in our scenario, renewables was doing really, really well. It's cheap, it's subsidized, um, and it's taking up the, the biggest share. So when we implement some zero carbon, it's just competing with renewable energy. This could be a really good thing. We don't necessarily want to put all of our ducks in, in one basket, of the, so, so to say, our eggs in one basket. Um, we, we want to have a diversi diversified options when it comes to our energy sources, but it's also something that because it doesn't exist yet, we might not want to bet on it. Um, the joke when it comes to nuclear fusion is it's it's always 10 years away. We've been working on it for decades and decades. Millions and millions of dollars have been forwarded to research. We're making progress, but um, it's still far out. And, and the researchers most close to the work on that um, continue to say that it's, it's coming, but it's still um, many years out there. And even when we do have some new zero carbon technology, we have to account for the fact that it will take time to scale up. So when we say we have a huge breakthrough, in new zero carbon technology. This would be um, technological diffusion at a scale never before seen for any type of energy source. When we think of like really fast technological diffusion, I always think about the cell phone. Um, how, you know, when I was born, we, nobody had cell phones. Um, it wasn't very common. They had just emerged. Um, back in the 80s, you had kind of the first a cell phone call, mobile phone call being made in a commercial setting. Um, and then uh, in the 90s, it became, it's, the prices started falling very fast. The technology improved. We got smaller and smaller cell phones, such that by the early 2000s, they were ubiquitous in countries around the world. And now today, uh, we have billions and billions of cell phones. And it's really enabled some, some areas of the world to just entirely leapfrog communication technologies, places where you didn't have phone lines before, but you had cell phones. So that's that was like say 30 years in which it took from first commercial cell phone call to widespread diffusion where that technology exists in everyone's pocket that is incredibly fast we would have to see something like that in the energy sector there are challenges with the energy sector it's not um some source of energy can't quite may, may not revolutionize things as much as the power of um, a new communications device but these are the kinds of things to think about when we think about well, would some new zero, zero carbon technology, is that something to bank on? Um, and you can see there that it doesn't really change the temperature outcome, but it does provide us more technological options if it were uh, successful, maybe uh, reduce some of our dependency on, on the batteries and storage devices needed for renewable energy. All right, we're at 2.2. We're also near the top of the hour. Um, I am curious, let's, I want to, I want to push it all the way to two, to, to, but we really don't have time. Um, so actually, I'm going to pause right there. Um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you all to figure out how do we get this scenario well below two degrees and 1.5. The way I can do that is I'm going to click on this button up here, share your scenario. In this case, I'll just copy the scenario link and I'm going to paste it into the chat. So all of you all will be able to click on that link that I just posted in, and you will be able to see our scenario. Take, open that scenario in your browser, 
and adjust the sliders and figure out how to get below two degrees. How can we get well below two degrees and how can we get towards 1.5? If you figure it out, I would love it if you would click the share your scenario and tweet it out, share it on Facebook, send it to us by email, something like that, um, so that we can see what were the next steps? What were the things that we didn't touch on today? I know um, carbon price was something that some of you all mentioned that we didn't touch on, um, and I'm sure many other things out here that you were thinking about, but we didn't get a chance to get to. Ma mainly, what I wanted to do here is to really just show you the power I'm using a tool like En-ROADS to talk about the possibilities of climate action and explore um, the things that, that might be needed. Um, I know also some of you all have probably written in uh, questions. I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes after the top of the hour to answer your questions if you have them about the simulator um, and about the work we do uh, with the tool. So hang around if, if you have a few more minutes um, and we will answer questions there. But um, for now, I also just want to thank you all for your attention, for joining today. Um, and, you know, it's like I said at the beginning, it's, a, it's an exciting time, at least for those of us here in the United States uh, who work on climate change and think about this issue a lot. I hope that um, the year ahead for 2021 um, will offer many promising actions and so that we can look to look to these scenarios and begin to see more ways in which uh, countries all over the world are enacting policies to 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 take action on climate and and of course there's no time to lose we we really have to we don't have um, another decade we don't have two decades to start working on climate change uh, the, the work has already begun and we need to ramp it up um, quite fast. So thank you all for joining. Um, I will stick around for questions. I know Caroline has been saving them, uh, so we'll get over to those as well. But if you have to go and you do have questions for us, you can always reach out to us as well um, on our support page. Uh, reach out to us at climateinteractive.org slash support and we'll, we'll be happy to get back to you there. Thank you all. Um, and um, Caroline, let me know what you have in terms of questions, but if you have to run now, uh, again, thanks for joining. All right, thanks, Ellie. Um, yeah, we had some great questions throughout, so let's just uh, dive in on one. Um, someone was wondering, they said they'd like to hear about how Enrich has evolved since it was first published, like how often the model uh, gets changed or updated. Uh-huh, yeah, that's a great question. So we um inroads has been years and years and years in the making um it sort of, in some ways it began as our other tool c roads um which really just looks at emissions reductions um and doesn't break things down by the sector level like the way inroads does um so we built we built inroads with this idea of wanting to answer questions like you know would some new zero carbon technology be beneficial on climate or what about you know the electrification of cars um, and and we released it uh, about a year ago um, publicly and since then every month we have released updates to it so um, on February 2nd uh, is when our next release of En-ROADS will be and uh, that one's going to actually be really exciting we're going to release um, a couple new uh, features, I believe, but also several new languages. So under the menu here that says language, currently um, En-ROADS is available in Spanish, Portuguese, and Turkish, um, but Chinese is coming, German is coming, uh, Bulgarian is coming. Uh, hopefully all of those will be ready by February, and then um, in March and April we expect to get other languages like French, um, I know is in the works, um, as well as several other languages as well. And if you're a translator, um, feel free to contact us. We, we really um, benefit from volunteer translators who have really taken inroads under their wing and, and done a lot of work on that. So that's some, some things that get released in the updates. Also, when um, better science comes out, we, there are new papers. Um, some of you all may have been on our email list and seen last in December, we released a major update to En-ROADS where we 
um, factored in a lot of the, the recent progress that has happened around renewable energy in terms of falling prices and recalibrated a lot of the, the baseline scenario for that. So uh, it's uh, there's a team of people always working on improving this and keeping it up to date and making sure it's uh, reflecting the best available science. Perfect. Thanks, Ellie. Um, a few people have asked just about speaking to how NRIS can comment on uh, regional policy differences, cities, communities, and maybe you could just explore uh, this versus our other model series. Yeah, so NRIS is global, global sources of primary energy. Um, and as a result, it doesn't show those regional differences. The way we use it in local, regional, national levels, um, of course, policymakers, government officials, you and me and all of us here, we don't have access to these sliders from the global scale. Action happens at smaller levels and then it builds. So the way in which we use it is in some of the ways in which I, I was demonstrating earlier um, within the workshop, which is to ask people, what, they're, what are they hearing about? What are some of the things that you're thinking about? Let's test that and say, what if the whole world took a similar kind of action? What if the whole world ramped up um, electric buses and electrification of the transport sector? Then we scale things up. So we use it as a as a way to kind of m mimic um, action at different scales. Um, when it comes to you know some when it comes to having those kind of that a little bit finer grain. Um, in terms of wanting to look at different regional action. One tool that we do have available um, is called Sea Roads. It's not, uh, it breaks the world into six different regions. Sea um, Roads, actually, I'll just pull it up um, here. And rather than looking at the world in terms of re renewable energy subsidies or energy efficiency, we have here US, EU, other developed countries, China, India, and the other developing countries. And you can set their emissions peak year, the reductions year. This is a way, um, particularly for those who are following the Paris climate negotiations and want to um, simulate the different NDCs, the different commitments that countries are making, you can do this kind of in a rough way with sea roads to just quickly run uh, what if um, scenarios with this. We also have a role playing game with sea roads called the World Climate Simulation, where people, play, um, a, create kind of a model UN climate negotiation game uh, that, that that's very popular with people um, all over the world. Many educators have used it in their classes um, and lots of other settings there. Perfect, thanks. Um, while you're kind of on that note, we did have some people who seem to be educators in the audience. Could you just maybe walk through our uh, our tools for online engagement and show people what uh, options we offer people for engaging students around inroads and our other models? Yeah, so um, we have, um, particularly because we know um, many of you all that are educators are um, using tools online, you're, you're leading your classes in Zoom and all kinds of things. We have this page. So again, this is under the tools menu here. I'm on the Climate Interactive website under tools, go over other tools, tools for virtual engagement. And here we have a summary of all of the different um, things we offer for people to use um, in virtual settings. So you can lead a workshop just like I just did. Um, that's, I would say that's the most popular way that I have seen um, educators out there using um, inroads with their classes of just kind of creating a co-creating a scenario. If um, maybe you want something that um, is just a, more of a take home assignment, we have a guided assignment, a homework assignment that you can give to your students and they can use inroads on their own to create a scenario um, with that. We also have um, a, a, a role playing game called the Climate Action Simulation. This is um, for people who, um, are looking for a really uh, robust experience. It's really dynamic. Um, with the climate action simulation, people break into groups representing different um, 
stakeholder group. So you have a clean energy group, you have a fossil fuel group, you have an agricultural group, and then they propose different actions based on their, their own interests within that stakeholder group and come up with a scenario that that, that, that exercise, rather than taking an hour-ish like we took today for the workshop, the climate action simulation usually takes at least three hours and can sometimes take um, more than that. Um, sometimes it's spread over multiple course periods. Um, and if you are, you know, looking at all of this and you're not really sure um, what you might want to lead, I would say the easiest approach is the inroads guided assignment. Or what you can do is you go um, to our list of ambassadors. So again, I'm on the web, the Climate Interactive website. I go up to About inroads ambassadors and you can look through our list of 275 different facilitators of inroads and see if there's somebody in the list um, uh, who has their contact information available and um, reach out to them and see if they might help you out with a uh, with an event perfect thanks um another question people were asking is um how did we decide on the sliders that are shown on the simulator and do we plan to add more? So the, what we, how we approached this is we wanted to create a way in which for all of these different sliders in the main interface that we could create a scenario that limits warming to well below two degrees. Um, and so it, the, the, we keep the sliders aggregated at a very high level um for this and we have lots and lots of additional sliders that we didn't even touch on today in uh these kind of additional then when you click on the three dots and in the advanced views you can find much more um different types to refine uh the ways in which you inter interact with things you know we didn't even talk about today carbon capture and storage but we have sliders built in on that Another area where we have a lot of things that we also didn't touch on today, uh, just because we were short on time, is assumptions. So our approach at Climate Interactive is that we don't want to create a tool here that's just a black box where you can't figure out what's going on and it doesn't make any sense. We want to enable you to um, change things. If you don't like this, like the, our assumption for something, change it and see if that produces a different outcome. This is really to help explore um, people's mental models. So there are a lot of different assumptions here. So for example, we can just click on climate sensitive, climate system sensitivities. We can change the climate sensitivity. sensitivity. There, this is an area where, you know, there is ongoing research to really zero in on what it might be. And uh, researchers have different viewpoints. Um, when we double the amount of carbon, how much does temperature go up? Um, other things like the uh, methane emissions from biological activity. You can adjust these things as you see fit. So we have a lot of sliders. We are adding more um, with our monthly updates as we come up with new features um, and are listening to you all out there in terms of where the where the, where's the conversation happening when it comes to climate climate action and climate solutions and how can we set up inroads such that it is relevant for that. So that's definitely something we keep in mind. Um, People write to us saying, you know, hey, I've just invented some new type of carbon removal. Will you include that in inroads? Well, maybe we'll include it in inroads in time if we see that it's a big, it's generating a lot of conversation in the climate discussion space, in the climate solution space. We're trying, we're trying to keep inroads up to up to date and kind of speak to those things, but don't just add anything. Um, and also, we have to, we, we're limited to in what we can model. Um, some things like uh, political action are, are harder for us to constru to put to, to model and so don't show up as well. Um, yeah, great question. Yeah, thanks. Um, can you speak a little bit to the nature of the workshop, like who it's typically can be run for and can it be adapted or customized to fit for say like a business or some other organization that's working to reduce emissions? Yeah, um, we actually have run the workshop in a lot of different business settings in particular. Um, it's been used widely in education settings, but really I haven't seen too many um, 
limitations in terms of the audience of where, where the workshop it, um, can be run. We have someone on our team who specifically works on our business engagements. So particularly for those Fortune 500 companies and large companies out there who are thinking about their climate um, planning and that kind of thing. If, um, if, if that's an, or a company where you're coming from, feel free to reach out to us and we, we can connect you with facilitators who might be able to lead a workshop in a, in a business setting. And I would say we've also seen a lot of kind of champions within businesses who have uh, learned how to use inroads and then shared it with, with um, their coworkers and colleagues. Um, sometimes these employees are located within sustainability departments. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're just um, people who are concerned about climate and want to get their um, company thinking more about the the whole range of climate actions out climate action out there. Um, I can think of some big champions of inroads that we have within you know the soft drink company Pepsi for example or the ag um, company Cargill. We've seen uh, uses of inroads there. So uh, and then lots of smaller businesses too. And that's also not to even mention the all of the different political spaces in which we've been able to get inroads out to, and we're seeing more and more engagement around that from citizen act activists and advocates who have taken inroads to their elected officials and shared it with them, to more high-level engagements where through um, uh, partnerships with MIT, we've been able to reach top decision makers, particularly in the United States, but are also looking for opportunities globally um, where we have reached uh, elected officials. Um, and many of, for example, many of the people who are in the President Biden's uh, climate department that he's creating, creating an office of many different people working on climate change, many of them uh, are very familiar with En-ROADS. Great, thanks, Ellie. Um, so I was wondering, regarding our scenario, can you speak to why uh, we're still seeing oil and gas uh, proceeds or to be so resilient through the end of the 21 or through the end of the, the century? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so even as we have really cheap renewable energy here and we have really cheap or cheap, this really cheap new zero carbon technology, we're still seeing oil and gas. Um, some other reason that is, is because we haven't done anything over here to touch our energy efficiency in the buildings and industrial setting. So there are settings in which we, and in particular electrification here. So um, I bet if we improve electrification, we'd see this go down some because um, uh, these are being used, the oil is being used as fuels in industrial settings. And we have to figure out how to switch those industrial processes to make them electric. Um, so let's just test it out, see. And here, if I, you know, here's where we were. If I increase the electrification of our buildings and industry, so that's heating, um, cooking here in um, at my house here in North Carolina in the, in the United States, I had to switch the house from running on oil uh, as, a, as a heating source to installing a heat, an electric heat pump. So I had to electrify the heating system um, such that it wasn't dependent on oil. Um, in many parts of the world, there are still there's still a lot of building and he, building heating that has happened uh, that happens through fossil fuels, gas, and oil, and and still more is being built. So like that's that's an example of where we need more electrification, making sure that cooking um, is able to happen on electric stoves and um, use all the the things there to really push those down. And also we haven't done anything to uh, disincentivize oil and natural gas. So that's why it's also part of the mix still is there's no tax on it. There's not even a carbon price. That's where we can, we, we, we really have to figure out ways of keeping it in the ground of limiting its use because it's there and we'll use it um, unless we do something to really scale it back. So we could do that through two different strategies. We could say, well, what if there, I mean, even a hundred dollar carbon price Let's see what impact that would have. That will really push things down even further. Um, and look at that, we've that that took us down to below two degrees. Um, so 
those of you all who have stuck around have seen some of the additional strategies it might take. We had to figure out just ways to not, so that we're not encouraged to use those fossil fuels that are sitting there underground. Um, we have the infrastructure and there's sort of this uh, inertia in the system that makes it really hard to change away from using those fossil fuels until we intervene in some way. Great, thanks, Ellie. Um, well, it looks like we're now almost 20 past the hour, so I was wondering if you could just point people back towards our support portal um, or give a slide with the, the support email. Um, yeah. We weren't able to answer every single question, but um, hopefully we got to most of them. Um, and yeah, yeah I'll give it back to you to wrap up. Definitely. Um, so thanks, thanks for all of you all that are, have stuck around some. If you have any questions, you can um, check out climateinteractive.org slash support and you'll find our community forum and where um, we have uh, tons of different topics on all different kinds of things as well as um, lots of frequently asked questions so you can see, see frequently asked questions here and comb through it there are dozens and dozens of different responses on all different types of topics type in something that you're interested in here uh, maybe you want to learn more about, you know, afforestation, and then you can read things like, oh, how does En-ROADS relate to Project Drawdown, or how do I simulate different types of carbon dioxide removal? Um, and if you can't find the answer to your question, uh, send us a support ticket, and um, uh, people on our team are standing by and happy to help you navigate different challenges, so that way you can use En-ROADS with different audiences. And that's really what our hope is, is that you take this tool, um, it's freely available, we're trying to provide as much as possible because we need climate action out there. Um, so we wanna support you in getting it out to the world and driving different conversations around climate. So um, keep in touch and thank you all so much for joining. I hope you have a great rest of the day and um, I hope to too, to learn more about and see the, events that you're a part of um, using inroads in the future. Thanks everyone. Take care.